Okay, so yeah, give a nice welcome to Glenn Frey presenting Cinema 4D from next time. Thanks. Hello. Yes, thank you guys. Uh, I just made sure that I do the right presentation uh, for you uh, because I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people that actually don't know what Cinema 4D actually does. Um, so, I'm going through um, the R17 features quickly, uh, which was supposed to be the whole 45 minutes. Uh, so, you just have an overview of what's new in our latest release, and afterwards I uh, will do a rig on a um, shark. And if we have enough time, I will even let a spider walk over the surface, which is also pretty cool. If you look at it, it's, uh, there are some features that makes it really cool because the spider walks automatically with eight legs on a surface. No matter what you do with the surface, you can change it afterwards and the, the um, legs react. So um, let's go through the presentation here so we have enough time for the fancy stuff. Um, like the fancy sound you heard. And here are some renderings um, that have been done in the past year with Cinema 3D. Um, Ike Sponsor. We have a guy from Ike Sponsor sitting over there. He's also doing a presentation about this great movie that did. Um, <laughs> I wanted to say Speed, but it's actually Seed. <laughs> um, yeah, very nice renderings and models. And uh, also this guy is very talented, Rafa Ramos, Silverwing. Um, He's very talented when it comes to uh, metal surfaces and light and scratches and stuff like that. Also done by Ike Sponsor. Incredible stuff they're doing. It's a Munich company working exclusively with Cinema 4D. This is again Raphael Rao. Uh, when we saw this for the first time, everybody was laughing in this room and we waited until he finally says, okay, I was joking, this is a photo. And he didn't. And we were waiting and waiting and he still didn't say it. And then he showed us the proof. And I mean, it's pretty amazing. You look at the details. There's fingerprints here. There's the, the coating coming off. This uh, pencil here is really incredible. And here's the wireframe. So you can see this is actually a model. Yeah, characters done in Cinema 4D. And other nice rendering examples. But yeah, isn't it cute? <laughs> okay, because if you, you liked it, I'll show it once more. Aww. And for the next one as well. Aww. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Wonderful. So, R17. Color chooser. We now have a color chooser in Cinema 4D, which makes it very easy to find colors and choose colors. We've got this color wheel with some handles, so you can find color harmonies like complementary colors uh, because you can move one handle and the others are moving in parallel. Um, and then we have this nice thing that is called pixel color picker. Uh, you load any picture, photograph, uh, painting, whatever in here, and then you use this detail slider to pixelate it, and then you can add as many um, color chooses as you want with this plus symbol and you get colors here. So you can very easily find a color mood of um, a photo and you can use these colors that you've chosen now. They, they snap actually to each and every pixel and you can make the color palette as, as uh, long as you want. And then in the end you can save this and then you have actually the whole color mood of this photo uh, because it's pixelated and still has, you can see it's still the same colors here. And then you save it on your hard drive, give it to anybody else, or use it for your own rendering. Pretty cool. Um, who knows which game this is? Uh, yeah. Uh, Monkey Island. Monkey Island, there it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> A handshake. A warm and sweaty handshake. Okay, yeah, this is the video about the color chooser, but I guess we skipped that because I already talked about it. Um, variation shader also very nice. Some people said, wow, I did this by hand for many, many hours and now it's finally there as a shader. And it's pretty cool what you can do with this. This is um, how it looks like with the, all the settings you have and parameters. Um, you can put variations into 
uh, scenes where you have many objects because you wouldn't do that by hand, like these buttons here. If you want to have every single button uh, have a slightly different color or probably uh, another texture so they don't look uh, like the one next to it. So uh, doing this by hand will take forever. You create another material, change the color, put it on that button and do this hundreds of times. This is nothing you would do. So with the variation shade, it's very easy and these are the results. You can easily see that uh, there's, in this picture, slight differences in color and texture. Um, here you can see that some of the leaves have a more light uh, green tone and others are darker. So you can put nice variations which make uh, the rendering much more realistic in the end um, than if you would render this with one green color or if you would have just some variations or stuff like this here, distribute colors. Uh, in this mosaic over the whole surface, impossible by hand. But with the variation shader, it's just a few clicks and you can change or uh, define the color range you want to use there. Uh, let's go back here so you have a before and after. In You can clearly see left without variation shader, right with. And there you see that there are some leaves that have a brown color, some are just brownish with green in it. So a very nice addition to uh, bring variations to every rendering where you have a lot of lots of objects. Sculpting improvements, there are actually a lot, I just clicked through them if you want to see the whole list. Uh, for the people that don't know this, in Cinema 4D we have a whole sculpting uh, tool in there, the way you can do... Um, uh, people said that work with ZBrush and, and uh, other sculpting programs that they do now 80 to 90 percent now in Cinema 4D because they can stay in Cinema 4D and only for the more sophisticated stuff, because obviously we don't have everything in there, um, is done in a different kind of program, because the, like ZBrush is there for many years, of course they have better tools. But we have a lot of tools in there, it's very easy to use, and, and it's um, very um, intuitively, um, if you work with this, and with uh, every release we bring new features to the sculpting tools, uh, I just show just a few here with this video. So, for example, sculpt to post morph is cool. Post morph is blend shades, uh, shapes actually. So, if you want to use face expressions uh, for a character, you can do this now with your uh, sculpting. So, I create another layer here called a layer angry, and then I use my sculpting tools to sculpt. This is an actual sculpt with millions of polygons. Um, I sculpt an angry face expression onto the face here and with just one click sculpt to post morph I instantly get a second object here in the object manager the other one can be deleted or made invisible and then you have a post morph tag and you can see base object and layer angry so you have immediately a second layer and you can now move between these two states of the face very cool visible stencil tiling so you have uh, the stencil now over the whole viewport, so you can actually see even if you wipe over the uh, over the surface how the stencil looks like. Or look at these two spikes here; they move both. But if you activate uh, surface distance, then surface-wise, the second spike is too far away. This is great for if you want to alter the lip, but not the upper lip, because surface-wise it's too far away. Uh, pretty cool to sculpt stuff like this. We have custom work planes, so with the control click you can add now custom planes here, you can move them to a different position, you can resize them, they even work with symmetry, and if you have placed them then you can sculpt and it will only, the sculpting will only happen until it reaches your custom plane, and you can do sculptings like this with it. So only once more, then I skipped to other features. Custom radial symmetry point mode, also very cool. We have radial symmetry, that means if I, you can see number of radial strokes is eight. So if I start drawing, you can draw something and it will be radially sym uh, symmetry. Is it right? Symmetry? No. <laughs> of course, you, you can see it here what happens. I start in the middle and then I go to the outer side and that's the problem. If you don't have a custom point, which is new in R17, you always have to start in the middle, 
draw something and you will always have the sculpting in the middle and go to the outside. But what if I want to sculpt something outside but not in the middle? You can do it with the custom symmetry point. Control click and you have your symmetry point and then you can do stuff like this, like spheres. And edge detection, the last one. Without edge detection, you can see I clearly I wipe over the surface and I destroy my other edge. With edge detection, I this cannot happen anymore. I just wipe until I reach the edge and nothing is happening. So this edge stays intact and undestroyed. If I start here, this edge is protected. So you can easily and fast do sculptings like this. So let's go to other features, formula shader. You can use a formula now to shade. And uh, I skip this year to Probably this rendering is not very good, but uh, you can see you can do nice Christmas paper with it. Just, just a small example. But I'm pretty sure people that know how to handle formulas, they know what to do with this. So a formula shader is now there in R17. OpenGL viewport dithering. This is a visible gradient. I, for myself, hate this if I see a gradient. This is a dithered gradient. And in Cinema 3D, you can clearly see the viewport looked like this with the gradient really visible if you have a transition between colors. And now in R17, without eating up performance, this is the standard, now you don't have this visible gradient anymore. Material override, also pretty cool. You want to render your scene without textures because it saves time. Uh, it's faster to render and you just want to see if your GI is correct, if your light is correct, but you don't want to render the textures. What do you do? You could delete all the textures and then undo it or save it as a second file and load the other scene file. But what you now can do is, with material override, you just activate it and put any material into the custom material field and just from that rendering, with three clicks, you go to that rendering, to a clay rendering. Here's a nice example, and the great thing about it is that, um, sorry, I clicked too much. Yeah, the, um, the great thing is that you can even preserve channels, and this is what is really cool, because you couldn't do that by hand with hundreds of textures. You can see this is the watch with textures. Now I activate material override, and I just drag and drop material in there. And now it renders as if I would have deleted all the textures and put just one texture on it. But the problem is, there's a, um, a glass surface. And if I render this, I cannot see the watch face anymore and the handles. And also alpha, the alpha channel is also gone. So if I want to preserve this, I go to my settings in there. And I preserve all the channels that I still want to render, like displays and alpha. Uh, transparency and so on, so it still renders as a clay render, but all the specific channels are still preserved. Which is pretty cool, because doing this by hand with hundreds of textures, just deactivating the color channel and activating or leave it activated for other channels is very time-consuming. Um, new OBJ import-export. We found out that OBJ is still the most used uh, import-export format, so we, we've rewritten it from scratch, it has nothing to do with the old import, and you've got a lot of options in there. Also, this one to save time, because I really would like to show you the shark and the, and the spider. I just clicked through it. A lot of options when it comes to import-export of OBJ. Material options, grouping options, UVs options, normals options, even flip options for, um, for polygons, and so on. The same for the export, geometries that are supported, polygons, triangle, quads, n-gons, axis flip and swap options, and so on, and so on. So, new OBJ import-export options in R17. Let's go to the next features. SketchUp support, like, you just have a whole library in the internet uh, People already modeled a lot of stuff and you can use it right away in your scene. So we have the SketchUp support now so you can directly load SketchUp files into Cinema 4D and use all these hundreds and thousands of objects instantly. Um, IOR presets for the transparency channel. We have a drop-down menu and now you have the right preset at your hand here 
for example, for glass, jade, milk, oil, pearl, PT, plexiglass, so you don't have to fiddle around with the IOR settings, so you have all the settings right there. New metabol features, also very nice. Look at the video. Sometimes it just clicks double, even though I just click once. New metabol features of and fancy music. So we've got a new mode here, triangle, and with that you can put two objects into each other, and then you have a nice transition, like a welding around the object. So it's like like putting uh, metal objects together, and you have a welding point, like it's, it's soldered together. And this wasn't actually possible before with the metabols. I, for myself, I've never used metabols, only barely sometimes, but now I would even use it for modeling stuff if I have uh, the need for a look like this where objects are looking like they, yeah, they welded together. Yeah, and motion tracker. We have a motion tracker in Cinema 4D, um, so you can put 3D footage on video directly in Cinema 4D. And we have enhancements now. Now we have a graph view, so two modes there to optimize the tracking because now you can find tracking errors. They are clearly visible, bad tracks are red, and you can select them and directly delete them. I think I um, fast forward forward uh, this video so again we can save time. Um, this is the graph mode here. In the graph mode you can see that we have a lot of tracks here and you can actually find a bad track because there are too many. But what you can do is here, you can go in and select just a specific part where you think there's a bad track. And then you hide unselected and now you can clearly see that where the most tracks are distributed, these are actually good tracks. And if there's one track that's out of range here or um, going into a different uh, direction, then you can be sure that this is a bad track. So you can select it and delete it. Or you can filter bad tracks out. So you just click on this handle, drag it down, and everything above is filtered out, so all the bad tracks are gone. Uh, we have different view modes, so let's move forward here. And we have something uh, to calculate our um, lens distortion. So lens distortion is when you have a lens like a fish eye, which is an extreme example. Uh, you, every straight line actually has a curve and if you want to get rid of that this is good for the tracker because the calculation um, the algorithm can work much better if you have straight lines so you put these lines here on each line where you know it should be actually straight and you follow this curve and with control click you add more points until you really mimic that curve you do this a lot of times in your scene, at least four times, but put as many lines in your scene as you want. Then you choose one of the lens distortion models and then you can click calculate and it calculates the distortion out of the image. And then you save your lens profile and so you have to do this only once for this lens. Every footage that you load afterwards you can simply load your lens profile and immediately the lens distortion is gone because you've already done the calculation with this lens. Um, what you can do also is that you load the lens distortion onto your 3D objects. So these 3D objects, if, you want, if I want to put them on my footage, then you uh, load the lens distortion. You can clearly see now it has the same distortion, the same curvature as um, yeah, my original footage and then you can put it on top of your distorted footage and it has the same distortion. So it depends on what you want. You can calculate it out of your footage or you can put it on top of your 3D objects. So this is um, the motion tracker. So you don't be confused if you come across pictures like this. This, even if it looks like you, you know these, these nice uh, photos where you have a puppy which is very close to the lens and the, the snout is really this big. This is no lens distortion. And because I, want, I was curious how good our algorithms are, so I put these lines you saw I put on the floor here around this big belly to see if it can calculate this actually. I was just wondering and 
actually, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see how great this works. It works even on a ballet. So if you have Christmas photos where people got bigger over the years and <laughs> you want to do them a favor, simply use Cinema 4D and you're good to go. Slim people everywhere. Yeah. Um, Polygon pen, we have the Polygon pen since I think R16. Uh, it's a great addition because it reinvented modeling for Cinema 4D. A lot of great tools which make a lot of fun modeling in Cinema 4D. And now we did the same for the spline tools. Spline tools now have a lot of options. We have the spline pen, we have the spline sketch, we have spline smooth and art tool. A lot of tools there, so now finally, even spline modeling makes a lot of fun because again for myself i never use splines because i couldn't really uh, create the the right art or the right shape i wanted to create now with the new spline tools it's really easy and it's a lot of fun because you have visual feedback let's look at this video here you have visual feedback uh, of what you're doing so if i use the spline if i use the spline pen for example I draw my lines and if I don't release the mouse button you can clearly see how my um, shape is going to be and you even have a visual feedback here. Do you see that? If I move one point on the fly you always see how your actual line looks like and how your line will look like if you release the mouse button. So dynamic feedback here and if I double click and match it straightens the, tang the tangents and you can do this with points and edges and just in a few seconds I have an object like this. I move the edges around, I break the tangents, and then with an extrude object, just in a few seconds I have this object, this solid object here. So uh, we have some spline smooth options, and this is something I really wanted for a long time. If you have distorted splines, you can now smooth them out. Doing this by hand really sucks, and this is so easy to use. Wipe over it, and it, fi it finally straightens the spline. And some other uh, spline tools like strokes, or you can project the spline onto another object so it gets the shape of the other object, or you can create spirals, and so on and so on. We have a Boolean operations now, you can create arcs really sophisticated arcs if you want to. We have a sketch tool and the sketch tool is also nice because if you have the sketch tool activated then you don't draw a new spline every time you wipe over it. You just redraw that specific part without creating a new spline on top of that. So if you want a new shape just wipe over it until it fits the shape that you want it. These are the arcs. Control click to, um, to uh, cut your spline and then you simply drag out arcs and you get an object like this even in a few seconds. You can select two edges and if you double click them then you get one arc out of both. You have six altering modes for the arc. You can see that if I, depending on where I click and drag, there's, this, it's different, uh, there's different behavior for the arc and different altering modes, really depending on where I click and drag my arc. Yeah, Boolean operations now with more than two splines, so you can use as many splines as you want and create shapes out of that. So you can use the standard splines that we have there, or you draw a spline, put everything on top of each other, and then you use the Boolean operations like spline, uh, subtract or spline union. So in this case I use spline subtract and out of these three objects I get this. Or I use spline union and then they unified and they are combined together to this object. So a lot of tools there that give you possibilities you haven't had before. So um, this is probably the biggest feature of uh, R17. It's the tick system and I know that Probably all of you have a big question mark now above your head, because what's the tick system? Um, people wanted a render layer system for many years, and we built the re or we programmed the render system or render layer system now with R17, but it's only a side feature of the tick system. What is the tick system? It is first, save different states of a scene in a single file. 
and its render layer. Why is that so great? Look at this. We have a scene. Let's imagine you have a scene with uh, hundreds of objects and you have a table and you have candles on the table and or what, whatever. And then the customer says, oh, I want different variations of that scene. So you, in one scene you have uh, a green table, in another scene you have a brown table, in one scene there are candles on the table, in the next scene there are fruits on the table. And then we all know customers. In the end, I can assure you, it happens all the time. In the end, the customer comes and says, yeah, I take all 20 variations, they're all great, but what I didn't notice in the beginning is, please, um, I hate the floor, please exchange the floor. You already did all the variations and you saved 20 files on your hard drive with every single variation. What happens? You open file number one, exchange the floor until you, it is the floor that the customer wants and then you open file number two, exchange the floor again, you open file number three, exchange the floor again and you reach file number five and you immediately feel the urge to kill the customer and then you come to file number ten and you have to exchange the floor twenty times. With the tick system it's not necessary anymore. Because what you do is you have your main take and then you create a new take. And the new take takes all the features from the main take because it's a child and this is the parent. With the new take you just make an override for every parameter in Cinema 4D. So make an override for the color of the table. Make it green. Then you create a new take and change the, the objects on the table. They are no longer candles, they are not fruits. So you make all the changes with every new take. And as soon as you activate a take, the color changes, the object changes, you can even change animation. So make variations of the animation and they change as soon as you activate your take. Now in the end the customer comes and says, please exchange the floor. And you say, yeah, no problem. Because what you do is you only exchange the floor in the main take and not in the new take and not new take two. And because you haven't created an override for the floor in these takes, they take the floor from the main take. So if you exchange it here, it's already exchanged here and already exchanged here. But they still have their overrides for the green table, the fruits and the candles. So a great variation system for all your files and it really doesn't matter what you do. We even have an auto take mode, so it automatically changes something if you alter a parameter. Um, it doesn't matter what you do. You can exchange colors. You can, for example, exchange textures and give it to the customer and say, do you want the tomato look like this or like that or like that? And you can change the light mood for your scene, make a daylight scene, a night scene. It doesn't matter, everything is saved in one file in your tick system. And there's another advantage. If your scene, for example, has two gigabytes, and you save a variation, you have no four gigabytes on your hard drive. And with another variation, you have six gigabytes, and so on. So, with 20 variations, you have 40 gigabytes on your hard drive. With the tick system, it stays two gigabytes because what you're changing is only parameter. And you don't save all the polygons over and over again. So a very sophisticated system. And now the question is, why is it also lender rare? Well, um, of course, it can also be used with render queue and team render. But why is it a render layer system? It is because we also have, because you can use all parameters in Cinema 4D with the take system. We also have render settings. You can create as many render settings as you want and then you give new take 1 this render setting and new take 2 this render setting. And this gives you the opportunity in conjunction with uh, compositing tech for example that you render your scene in take number 1 without shadows. And then in take number 2 you render your scene where the table is green without shadows. And then you render only the shadows with take number three. And then you render uh, a mask, only the mask and nothing else with take number four. And in the end, the token system takes care that everything is saved and named correctly on your hard drive. So what you get in the end. Let's look at this video here. What you get in the end is
Here I click render just once. And you see it renders all files one after another and this is what you get in your hard drive. It's all sorted, it's all named automatically and you can see I have take blue, so it's the blue ball, bowling ball. Then the next is just the mask take. The next is the main take, so it's the red bowling ball and the last one is the shadow take. And then you can directly take this folder, drag and drop it into After Effects and use it in the compositing tool that you want. And have all the render layers directly there, just with one click of rendering. So a very sophisticated system. Um, also, for R17, we made some changes to the content library, so around 150 changes and additions. So we've got a lot of objects changed, so you can use them right away in your project. This is like, we have beds, we have ovens, uh, CD trays that you can open and close, change the size, uh, normal uh, everyday objects like a hammer, characters, uh, jars and, and uh, curtains, folding, closing systems, like uh, this cupboard here where you can um, define how many shelves this cupboard should have or what the size is. We have a bookshelf generator where you can distribute um, books over a shelf. We've got HDRIs and color palettes and so on and so on. If you want to see the video, simply go to a web page and you can watch the movie which uh, also probably has a list where you can see all the changes. Uh, the bookshelf generator is very easy to use. You simply uh, select polygons and then you have a lot of options to distribute the books there. You can give them different sizes. You drag and drop textures into a folder and then they all get different textures and so on and so on. And in the end, a rendering created with hundreds of books that you just created in just a few minutes can look like this, for example. So, I think uh, also animation enhancements. This is page number one. A lot of changes have been made because we listened to our customers. Many people were complaining, we need this, we need that. Animation could be easier and we did it. We implemented a lot of features. We have a Euler filter, filter now for gimbal lock prevention. Um, you can also, you've, there's also something um, that the tangents behave differently now so you can get rid of overshoots and this is page number two so really a lot of changes so if you're animating have a look at this if there's something in for you as well. We made some optimizations so with this character and all the, uh, the joints selected in R16 it had 15 frames per second in R17 it's 111 frames per second so a lot of changes under the hood. We have Houdini engine integrated into Cinema 4D so you can load Houdini assets directly into Cinema 4D so all the dynamics calculations, fluid simulations, they are done in the background. Houdini is loaded, you don't see it, it's loaded in the background. It does the calculation but you use it in the Cinema 4D environment and you can use all the tools of Cinema 4D in conjunction with Houdini and depending on what parameters can be changed with the assets that you get from somebody that built the assets. So a great addition also there if you want to collaborate with people that work with Houdini. OpenGL is now on 3.2, Python on 2.7 and so on and so on. So this is R17 and thank you. Um, I probably was as fast as Eric <laughs> with my talking. Um, normally I'd like to explain everything very slowly so it's uh, everybody gets what I'm trying to um, to explain here, but um, yeah, I find it more interesting if we now go to the character stuff. So let's have a look at with the auto rigger in Cinema 4D, you can easily do stuff like this, like this character, for example. You can see here, this is done with the auto rigger, so it was rigged with the rigging system of Cinema 4D, and it's also animated with C Motion, where you can make a walk cycle for a character. Um, so with the C motion, it's not like there are animations pre-made for you. You do the animations and you, with the splines you can change. You can even put your own animation style into your character. So if 
somebody that has a specific Disney style where you really see, oh, I know that style, it's probably that animator, he can put that style actually into C-Motion. It's not predefined. Um, but it's only for walk cycles. So if you quickly want to make a character run, see if your rigging works or if you want to distribute uh, uh, insects over a surface that walk over a surface and you don't want to hand animate every single character so you make hundreds of, of uh, spiders like in our case what we're seeing in a few minutes. Um, you can make them walk pretty fast with C-Motion because it's an easy uh, system to make characters walk. Um, so you can do stuff like this or you can make uh, stuff like this here. So let's have a look at the spider here. And the great thing is with C-Motion is that you can afterwards even go in and make changes to the surface here. So let's grab my magnet tool and let's see if I haven't selected any polygons. Let's see how big this is. This is 100 centimeters. I don't know if this is, oh, it's probably a little bit small. So let's make it 500. And I probably close the other programs here. Okay. Yeah, what you can do is you can afterwards go in there and alter the surface. And it doesn't matter because the character will recognize this and then move the feet over the new surface. So you can change it afterwards. And also shards, emotion, um, there it is. So here's the shark that I'm going to um, rig now. So let's get rid of some of the features here. For example, the light lines and the grid, which is disturbing, and also probably um, the camera and the horizon line. And let's make the environment invisible. So if we look at this now, this is, um, if you want to rig a shark, it's probably, at least in my case, it's taking a, a few hours. If you're good in rigging, then it's probably faster, but actually I can tell you that with the auto rigger, you can do this in just a few minutes and I will show you how this works. And the great thing about it is that you have templates there, but you also have the possibility to take the whole rig afterwards, look at it and, and make any change and change and alter it to your needs, to your um, rigging or to your animation needs. So what we have here, you can clearly see if I hit play, there's no rig actually in the scene. It's only this mesh of the shark. And I want to rig this now. So what I do is I create my character object. In there, I can choose between different templates. Advanced biped, uh, biped, bird, fish, insect, uh, mocap, quadruped, reptile, wings. And you can even mix between these um, templates. So if you have a character that has a horse body and the upper body is human, you can do that even with wings. Or if you have a character that has uh, nine legs instead of eight, eight. Um, so even impossible characters are possible here. It's not limited to what's in real life. So in this case, I'm choosing, of course, a fish. And let's make the shark um, invisible because it, the rig, the template is made for a fish. So it's very small. We change the, the size afterwards. So in this case, I start with my spine and I use spine IK and then I use, let's zoom in here so we can see what we are building. This is my spine and then I use, uh, for example, fin IK. This is one. If I select another fin, it reacts intelligent and creates it on the other side. So it's red here. So I have two fins now. Um, a tail, IK of course, because I want uh, a dynamic behavior afterwards. So a tail, IK, we have a tail now. And then we probably need also a dorsal fin, which is the fin on top of the back. And that's it. That's enough for our shark. Um, 
you can see that the shock is much bigger so we have to go into the adjustment mode now so we have four modes we have to go through here build adjust bind and animate so in this case I'm going to adjust mode here and because we need to save time I'll just show you quickly what I'm doing here you can grab the character in total here and simply resize it quickly so it fits somehow um, the size of the shark and you can see this should do the trick here and now I make it fit because every character looks different I need to make it fit my shark so I move all the components here around you can move them you can rotate them you can simply um, take single points here and move them out so you can really make it fit every character no matter how the character looks like just make sure that the points you're moving here are actually inside of the mesh so the calculation of the weighting is correct afterwards and it works better if the points are inside of the mesh and you can see you do this actually in three different modes so you do it from the left side let's see what else we can move here the fin here can be adjusted so this is from the side and now we go to the front perspective and then you can see that we can even move the whole system to the side so it fits really and then you move and you can see it's even working with symmetry so if you do it for one hand and with every single finger you only have to do it once and again make it fit and so on and then you do it from the top perspective and because I want to save time I load the file that I prepared while you were eating outside so you can see that this, these points are inside now I open the shark start adjusted and this is what I did already I placed them correctly this takes I think I guess five to ten minutes to place them correctly and afterwards always go around your um, your uh, rigging and your object to see if really all points are inside of the mesh so this took me like five minutes to place these points now the only thing I have to do until, until I start animating is I have to bind it to a mesh so you just go into the character system and go to the third mode which is binding and drag and drop all the polygon meshes that need to be attached to the joints into this field and that's it you quickly go to animate and just like that from a polygon object that wasn't rigged you have it directly rigged and animated and all the weightings are painted when I drag and drop the polygon object into the polygon field the weighting is already there but of course there are some parts in for shark it's not that difficult but for a human body you know probably if you've done rigs uh, there are some specific parts like the shoulder that need specific weighting of course you can go in there and reweight specific parts or repaint the whole weighting whatever you want but you have here uh, a starting point so you don't have to paint weights all over the whole system for every single joint by hand which can sometimes take hours somebody here who has already rigged a character raise your arm and you probably know how tedious this is to paint the weight so now if I want to see the whole character let's go in here I go to controls manager and what I see now is components this is the components I chosen here from uh, my template but of, of, of course I can go in here and say full hierarchy so let's look at this here this is the full rig of the shark and here I somewhere have even the controls here it is so I can change the speed here now this is something somebody already built here of course you can animate it by hand if you get rid of this so you can change the speed you can change if the nose wiggle is too much or it should be even more or it should be less and the tail wiggle so let's make it changes to something more realistic speed is okay I guess nose wiggle so stuff like that and if you think that this is too wobbly then you can of course go in this is the I think the dorsal fin so let's find the corresponding joints here um, dorsal fin 
I think it's this one here. Go to the dynamics and you can see the strength. You can change that. So make it stiffer or you can see if you use the wrong settings just to make clear that this is actually the right setting here. <laughs> so you can make position hold even higher. So you can make all the changes here and just like that I can go in here and animate the shark. I move from that point to that point, move the shark over here and then I go into the middle, frame 100, <laughs> move it up here and then I go to the middle here and probably rotate it like that and then I go to frame 150 and rotate it like that and just like that really from having nothing I have an animated shark in five minutes. I have an animated shark in like five minutes. I have an... <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I don't get paid for this. I just do it for fun and for happiness and because I, I like when people are happy and so at least I need an applause. Yeah, so this is the shark and really easy to do. And of course you can go in here and make all the changes you want. So if I go into character and let's have a look here. Where's the tornado? <laughs> yeah, tornado. We need a tornado now for Sharknado 3. <laughs> of course, weight tool. You can see here is my weight that the system already painted for me. Yeah, imagine doing this by hand over and over again for every single joint. It takes forever. And with this, I have it in just a few minutes. Uh, apropos minutes, um, how many minutes do I have? I'm finished. I'm finished already. Du bist sowas von fertig. Yeah, okay. Um, I wanted to show you how I make the, the spider um, crawl over the surface. But if somebody's interested, please come to me after this presentation here or after. The next presenter is finished and I can show it to you on my computer. So, thanks for watching. I'm very sorry that I had to talk so fast. Hopefully, wait, hopefully, hopefully I can give you just a small glimpse of what Cinema 4D can do. Um, it's, of course, a lot more. If you want to try it out, grab a demo version and I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Also, Sebastian, my colleague is over there. He can give you answers to any question and he can also show you the Houdini engine combination with some of the... Thanks a lot for watching and not falling asleep and <laughs> hope to see you soon. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks a lot. Okay, we will have a short break of about 15 minutes, so we will carry on at a quarter past four.